What's for breakfast? What's for lunch? What's for dinner? What's for snack? Wherever you are in the world, whatever time zone you're in, before anything else, soul food first, now in season five. This is Pastor Din Padayag. Welcome to Soul Food First here on Grace TV. Yesterday, we talked about reconciliation. We learned that Adam sinned and disobeyed God, resulting in being spiritually and physically alienated from Him. And we who came from Adam also became sinful and alienated. But just like what God did to Adam when He made a provision of a skin covering His nakedness from an animal whose blood was shed and then reconciled Him to Himself, God also provided Jesus Christ and His blood uh, that He shed on the cross for us to be personally reconcilable and savable. But the question is, will everyone be saved and reconciled? Now, there are few declarative truths that we must understand. Number one, God wants or desires all men to be saved. And that is very clear in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 down to verse 4. Here the Bible says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we have God's desire. He wants people to be saved, all people to be saved, and the saved ones to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, in one of the saddest chapters of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, the chapter where sin entered the world and the judgments were pronounced, we find God's immediate promise of a Redeemer, a seed of a woman that would crush the head of the serpent or Satan. And from that time on, we find the, you know, thin thread in which we see the amazing preservation of a lineage from whom the Savior will come. And in the New Testament, we have the incarnation of this God-man, Savior, whom we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. And referring to the purpose of His coming, John chapter 3, verses 16 down to verse 17, here the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in verse 17, the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So that's the purpose why Christ came. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of this present dispensation of grace, puts it this way in his own writing to the young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And how is he going to accomplish it? Well, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 5. In verse 6, the Bible says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, the Bible says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, here's again, Christ died for us. 
So God is going to reconcile and save the world through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, the Bible says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, Christ Jesus, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, Satan's plan was to kill and destroy the seed, you know, the Redeemer that would come from a woman, the seed of the woman, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He thought that when the Savior was dead, God's plan of saving the world would end. That would be good news to him and bad news or bad news to us or the whole world, right? But God, in His foreknowledge and purpose, turns the seemingly uh, bad news into good news. That what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross had become the basis of the gospel of salvation. So when He died, when Christ died, He died for our sins. When His blood was shed, it was for our remission and the remission of our sins. When He was buried, it was a picture of our sins, not only forgiven, but also forgotten. And when He rose again, because the Bible says after three days, He rose again. And when He rose again, we can now be justified by the Father and we can live a brand new life because Christ rose from the grave. And all this happened because God desires and wants people to be saved. Number two, God removes all the barriers so that man can be reconciled to Him. That's another uh, truth that we must understand. God removes all the barriers so that man can be reconciled to Him. Now, as far as God is concerned, He has done nothing against man. Again, He has done nothing against man. So, He needs not to do anything to set Himself right with man. God is always perfect and He remains to be God and holy and pure and he stays where he was it's man again it is man that is uh, offending God and so man needs to do something to satisfy God's righteousness for him to be reconciled and be saved that sounds really great now the problem is man is spiritually bankrupt he is disabled, incapable, and unable to satisfy God's justice. So he suffers the eternal and the just uh, punishment and condemnation of sin. But God saw this dire situation and it was at this very point, very moment that Christ intervened. The perfect, sinless Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ was able to do what no other man could do. In His love and grace, the Bible says, He took our place and became us on the cross and He suffered the eternal consequences of sin to pay and meet the righteous demands of God's justice. So when Christ shed His blood, when he died on the cross, when he was buried, when he rose again after three days, he completely, perfectly, and satisfactorily met the righteous claims of God against the sinner. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says, That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, 
Does this verse mean that because the world is now reconciled, all are now individually reconciled and saved? Well, the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, the next verse is very clear. In verse 20, the Bible says, Now then, we are ambassadors, referring to the believers, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So there is still a plea for people to be reconciled. So it is obvious that while God removed the barrier of sin, and so people are now brought near to Him, it is still important that God, through the believers, has a plea that people must be reconciled and be saved, you know, from their sins. So, what did Christ's death uh, on the cross accomplish? Well, while Christ's work did not auto uh, automatically save the entire world, the people of the world, it removed the sin barrier. Again, Christ's death removed the sin barrier so people can now freely come before the Lord by faith, which otherwise, the Bible says, uh, God removed or Christ removed the barrier of sin which otherwise would not have made it impossible for God and His love to save sinners if there was still uh, that barrier. So, this means that because Christ, bloodshed, death, burial, and resurrection, reconciliation, and salvation have now their righteous Basis. It means that because Christ already died on the cross and He already completed the work of salvation, now uh, reconciliation and salvation are now possible to those who will come to the Lord in faith. There is now that righteous basis of reconciliation and salvation. Everyone is now savable. Anyone regardless of nationality, age, culture, language, everyone can come before the Lord and be saved. They can come by faith. Everyone is now individually and personally reconcilable. Number three, another declarative truth that we must understand is that reconciliation of the world does not equate to salvation of the world if the reconciliation of the world means the salvation of the entire humankind then it would be unwise for god today to beseech to plea men and women to be reconciled it would be unnecessary for god to give those who are already reconciled and save a ministry and a message of reconciliation. They would not make sense at all if everyone uh, is already reconciled and saved. Well, the fact that Paul beseeched people to be reconciled despite the world already being reconciled proves that reconciliation is not equivalent to salvation. Reconciliation uh, simply means that people have been brought near to God because God removed the sin barrier. That's the meaning, meaning of reconciliation. God removed the sin barrier so people are now brought near to God. And that's possible through what Christ did on the cross. But one still needs to respond accept and receive God's provision for reconciliation and salvation to occur. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in the book of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 verses 10 down to verse 11. Here the Bible says, 
For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Question, is reconciliation enough? Is it enough to be near to God? Because that's the meaning of reconciliation, being brought nigh or near to God. Is reconciliation enough? Verse 10 continues, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So it is very clear that uh, reconciliation is one thing. It's a different thing than of that salvation. So there is reconciliation first. That is the removal of the sin barrier and bringing people near to God. Then there is that personal salvation by grace through faith. That is what the scriptures say. So reconciliation is something that God has provided but you know man should receive it in order to benefit from it Romans chapter 5 verse 11 says and not only that but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation so there is that provision of reconciliation from God by removing the sin barrier. God says, all right, you are now free to come. You can come because you are now near and there is now that open space for people to come. But then people must receive that provision of reconciliation for that person to be reconciled and saved, for people to be reconciled and saved. We'll all be reconciled and saved. This uh, is our first uh, question today. We'll all be reconciled and saved. You know, some people, uh, they teach about universal reconciliation. It is a teaching that all intelligent beings will finally be saved. The teaching of universal reconciliation is not based on scriptural truth that is very uh, true but rather it is based on emotionalism it is simply based upon the belief that God is too loving and God is too kind to punish uh, sinners in hell and that he will therefore take everyone to heaven so God feels sorry for the sinners and uh, he's so loving and kind and so he doesn't want them to spend eternity in the judgment in the lake of fire. And so according to this teaching, God in his love, he would take everyone to heaven, including even Satan and the fallen angels. That is just blasphemous. It is uh, based on the belief, again, that God is too loving and kind to punish sinners in hell and that He will therefore take everyone to heaven. Others believe that God will do it apart from any provision, meaning even the people will not believe, it's okay. They will go to heaven even without the provision that has been made by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is kind of ridiculous. Others also believe that the idea of a Christ's death was actually designed to save every fallen being, whether man or angels. They believe that at the end of everything, at the end of this drama, whatever they call this situation in this world, at the end of everything, even Satan and his fallen angels will be saved. Beloved, that is not true in the scriptures. And one of the obvious mistakes, of course, of this teaching about universal reconciliation is the misunderstanding of Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. The Bible says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, 
by him with the things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of Christ. And they're saying, now that's the verse, universal reconciliation. Well, they are misunderstanding this verse. The problem is they equate reconciliation, the removal of sin barrier and the bringing of people nigh or near to God with salvation. That's their problem. That's a big problem. It is true that God has reconciled the world to himself. He already removed the sin barrier. The people are now made near unto God. And this is resulting in the people being brought near to God. But the world is not saved yet. The world is not saved yet. That's why we are still preaching the gospel. That's why Christ has given us the message and the ministry of pleading people to be reconciled and to be saved from their sins. Yes, the basis of reconciliation and salvation has been laid already. The provision of reconciliation and salvation has been given, but the world must receive by faith the reconciliation that Christ has effected before they can be saved and fully placed in Christ. In simple terms, the people are already near God through the reconciliation. There is no sin barrier anymore. They are now near God, but the people need to be in Christ. And that is only possible when they believe and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. If they don't believe, it is obvious they will not, again, they will not be saved. For men to be saved, we find that Christ had to incarnate. The Bible says he became man. Now, to save Satan and fallen angels, he must have taken upon himself the nature of angels, right? It's necessary that the Savior must take upon himself the form of angels. But what does the Bible say? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 16, it is very clear here that Christ took not on him the nature of angels. So, there is no provision, beloved, of reconciliation and salvation for angels. There is provision for mankind. God wants all people to be saved, but there is no hint in the scriptures. There is no hint in the word of God that the devil and the angels will be saved. However, the Bible is very clear on this, that the lake of fire, the eternal lake of fire, is prepared for the devil, that is Satan, and his angels. The lake of fire is prepared by God for Satan, the devil, and his angels angels they will not be saved we know that as indicated to us in the book of matthew chapter 25 verse 42 beloved tune in tomorrow as we answer another uh, question thank you very much for watching enjoy your soul food you are watching soul food first on grace tv please follow us on the grace tv facebook page and please subscribe to our grace tv youtube channel until next time, God bless you. Bye!